Welcome to Hamburgers and Horror, the home of meat, monsters, and mind-altering cassette tapes. I'm Noah Hook, and today we're looking at David Cronenberg's Videodrome. This 1983 body horror extravaganza follows Max Wren, the owner of a sleazy TV channel called Civic TV. The usual sex and violence he shows on the channel becomes a bit boring once he comes into contact with a strange, violent new show called Videodrome, as he seeks out more information on the mysterious, politically driven torture stream, Max begins having some downright grotesque hallucinations. He tries to unravel the mysteries around Videodrome and its shady producers, all while trying to decipher what is real and what is not. Videodrome was of course written and directed by David Cronenberg. He is a master at creating mind-bending, visually horrifying films, often combining themes around technology, sexuality, and violence. While some of the tropes already existed, Cronenberg has been identified as one of the originators of the body horror subgenre. They had to create that name to describe his movies. Many people consider Videodrome to be the quintessential Cronenberg film, but just a few of his other masterpieces include Dead Ringers, Crash, The Fly, Naked Lunch, The Brood, and Scanners. He has very few duds, and even the worst Cronenberg films are at least more interesting than the average film. For Videodrome, Cronenberg took inspiration from his own childhood. As a young boy in Canada, his TV would pick up American channels late at night, and he always imagined coming across something very violent and grotesque. By 1981, Cronenberg had proven himself as a writer and a director, allowing him to get bigger budgets than the movies he had previously made, and he was also just getting a lot of amazing offers like the opportunity to direct Return of the Jedi. That certainly would have been interesting, but he turned it down, wanting to focus on his own material. Videodrome stars James Woods from Salvador, Once Upon a Time in America, and Another Day in Paradise as Max Wren, Debbie Harry from Union City, Hairspray, and the lead singer of Blondie as Nikki Brand, and Sonia Smiths from The Outer Limits, Odyssey 5, and The Eleventh Hour as Bianca Oblivion. It also stars Peter Dvorsky, Leslie Carlson, and Jack Creeley, and a lot of the smaller roles were filled by local stage actors. Filming lasted about two months, with the first week being designated to filming all of the pre-recorded films and messages we see in the movie. Cinematographer Mark Irwin, who also shot The Fly, The Blob, and Scream, did not enjoy mimicking the bland television style of shooting for those scenes, but he at least got to experiment with the rest of the movie. Three different endings were actually filmed, but I think only the proper one has seen the light of day. I might be wrong about that, though. There obviously needed to be a badass effects team, which was led by Rick Baker, who has created effects for An American Werewolf in London, Men in Black, and The Ring. As we'll see shortly, he got very creative with Videodrome. The score composed by Howard Shore follows Max's descent into video hallucinations. It starts out with a lot of traditional orchestra music, but slowly transitions to more electronic sound effects. Videodrome was sadly a box office flop, only bringing in $2 million from its $6 million budget. It was a bit more impressive to critics though, who enjoyed how shocking, disorienting, and political the movie was. It has received many awards and accolades, and it currently has a 78 and 80% on Rotten Tomatoes, so while not everyone loves it, Videodrome has remained an important classic. I have never seen Videodrome, and I am very excited to finally sit down and give it my full attention. I hope everyone brought their own VHS tape, because we're watching Videodrome. The movie opens with an ad for Civic TV. Civic TV, the one you take to bed with you. And Max's assistant, Bridie, speaks to us through a TV screen, urging us to awaken from our dream-filled unconscious. This is Max's daily wake-up cassette, which helps him prepare for his day. This is literally me struggling to get out of bed every morning. This is also me having coffee and day-old pizza for breakfast, and this is where I stop describing similarities between myself and Max Wren. He heads over to a seedy hotel where he meets with a Japanese pornographer hoping to have his latest series on Civic TV. Max brings one of their VHS tapes back to the office, which involves a woman utilizing a little samurai dildo. He and his partners, Moses and Rafe, discuss the video and its potential, with Max finding it too soft. Max heads over to meet Harlan, who operates Civic TV's illegal satellite dish, which they use to pirate porn from all over the world. They found a very well-protected video, simply called Videodrome, which Harlan believes came from Malaysia. The video shows a woman seemingly being tortured in a red room with a big wall of clay. 
and Max is interested enough to have Harlan pirate the entire next episode when it emerges. Max is appearing on the Rena King show along with radio host Nikki Brand and media prophet Professor Brian Oblivion. Rena asks Max why he owns a TV channel specializing in porn and violence, to which he says he saw a chance to give audience something they couldn't get anywhere else. She asks him if his channel contributes to the ever more violent and sexually perverse state of Canada, but Max argues his channel allows people to have a safe outlet for their fantasies and frustrations. Nikki argues that people are growing more addicted to stimulation and Max's channel contributes to that. Max points out her bright red dress is very stimulating, to which she agrees, and Max goes straight into asking her on a date. Rena asks Oblivion for his insight, and he says the TV screen has become the retina of the mind's eye. He only comes on TV through a TV, and soon everyone will have special names designated to make the cathode ray tube resonate? Um, thanks Dr. Oblivion. Harlan has pirated more Videodrome, which is just an hour of plotless torture, murder, and mutilation. Max is impressed by the low production costs and how talented the actors are, and wants to see more. Harlan shares that the signal isn't actually from Malaysia, only disguised to seem like it. It's actually coming straight out of Pittsburgh in the US of A. Max arrives at Nikki's radio station, where she basically functions as a live therapist to people who call in. I guess their date went well, as Nikki is at Max's and wants to watch some porn. She finds the Videodrome tape and pops it in, and to Max's surprise, she really likes it. Our girl Nikki is a sadomasochist, she likes it rough and bloody. Max doesn't think he'd be into that, but when Nikki Brand asks you to pierce her ears during sex, you better suck on those bloody lobes like there's no tomorrow. Oh shit, how'd y'all get in the red room? That kind of kinky fun time causes Max to come into work late, where pornographer Masha wants to show him her newest ancient Greece-themed film. Max is bored with this softcore stuff and is only interested in the rough stuff. He asks her if she's heard of Videodrome, and she agrees to track down where it happens and find out who's running it. That night, Max learns Nikki is heading to Pittsburgh for two weeks, and she plans on finding and auditioning to be on Videodrome. Max warns her of the dangerous people involved in the underground market, and tells her to stay far away from Videodrome. Nikki just takes it as a challenge though, and proceeds to burn herself with a cigarette. Mmm, burnt skin smoke. He meets up with Masha, who has learned about Videodrome through the underground grapevine. She advises him to leave it alone, as it is completely real, snuff TV. Max doesn't believe that, as it would be easier to just fake it, but Masha says it as something his channel does not, a philosophy. Max wants the name of someone he can contact, and once he offers to include her show on Civic TV, she tells him to contact Professor Brian Oblivion. Max tracks the Oblivions to a homeless shelter, the Cathode Ray Mission. Here, the homeless are given little cubicles to eat, drink, and most importantly, watch TV. Max makes his way to the back where he finds Bianca Oblivion, the daughter of Brian. She brings him up to her office where they discuss Dr. Oblivion's belief that television will help the homeless re-enter society. Max wants to speak to her father, but he will have to go through her first. If Brian is interested in continuing the dialogue, he will send Max a cassette tape to watch as he hasn't engaged in a real conversation in 20 years. He tells Bianca his preferred format is Videodrome, and when she claims to not know what that is, he tells her to ask her father about it. Max is checking out his new gun when Bridie arrives to drop off his wake-up cassette. And she has learned that Nikki is not in Pittsburgh for work like she said. She had a month of paid leave and decided to take it now. And when Bridie picks up the Videodrome tape, Max fucking slaps her, imagining Bridie as Nikki. He comes to and apologizes, adding that he thinks he is getting a rash. He apologizes for hitting her, but Bridie says he didn't hit her. She offers to stay the night to look after him, but Max politely declines, and on her way out she tells him the second cassette is from Brian Oblivion. Let's see what we have here. Well that's not good, or maybe it is depending on what you're into. He plays the tape which starts out with Oblivion rambling about how the battle for North America will be fought in the video arena. Since the screen is the retina to the mind, that makes the television a part of the brain. Whatever happens on the TV exists as the viewer's own experience, making television the true reality. 
Max scoffs at Oblivion until the doctor directly speaks to him by name. He tells Max his reality is already half video hallucination and it could become entirely hallucination if he isn't careful. Oblivion says he was having visions when a tumor was discovered in his brain, and he believes the visions caused it. He could feel the visions taking organic form, and when the tumor was removed, it was called Videodrome. As he gets choked to death, he says he was Videodrome's first victim. Max asks what Videodrome wants, only for Nikki to emerge from the Executioner's costume and tell him she wants him. She begs him not to make her wait, and the TV starts pulsing, moaning, and getting real veiny. Max, do not fuck the television. Max, oh no, Max. He returns to the TV soup kitchen and returns the tape to Bianca, who does know about Videodrome and its dangerous side effects. She asks him how long he's been hallucinating, and he realizes it started after his first time watching Videodrome. She asks how he found it, and he tells her about the pirate satellite dish and finding it by accident. She shares that the tone of the hallucination is determined by the tone of the tape's imagery, but the signal within Videodrome that actually causes damage can be delivered through anything, even just a test screen. The signal causes a brain tumor in the viewer, and the tumor is what creates the hallucinations. Max is pissed she let him watch this tape, but she explains that Videodrome is after her, and she thought he may have been sent by them to kill her. He asks to speak to Brian again, but turns out all that's left of Oblivion is his tape collection, as he died nearly a year ago due to Videodrome. This explains why Oblivion seemed a bit incoherent on the talk show, he's made thousands of tapes and Bianca sends them out to keep their work alive. Oblivion helped create Videodrome, he saw it as the next step for mankind, but his partners wanted to use it for more nefarious purposes. He tried to stop them and was killed for it. She gives him some tapes which will hopefully explain what is going on in greater detail. After learning that Harlan has not been hallucinating, shirtless, itchy Max sits down to listen to Oblivion. The doctor doesn't think the lump in his brain is a tumor at all, but actually a new organ. He believes frequent doses of Videodrome cause the organ to awaken, which allows one to produce and control hallucinations. You can create your own new reality. After all, our perception of reality is the only thing that really matters. And Max's rash has turned into a big fucking vaginal torso slit. Sure, Max, stick the gun inside. Great idea. Really get in there. Uh-oh, Max got his hand stuck inside, and now it looks like the gun is trapped inside him. The phone rings, and a voice tells Max that a man named Barry Convex has a car waiting for him outside. Having little to lose at this point, Max hops in. A little TV turns on, and Barry makes his introduction. He is the director of Spectacular Optical, a company that makes cheap glasses and missile guidance systems for NATO. Well-rounded company. Oh, and they also make Videodrome. He expects one day Videodrome will change the world, but what Max and Harlan found were test signals not meant to be seen by the public. Max is dropped off at a spectacular optical and heads inside, where he tries on some fun new spectacles, which Barry explains are part of their new spring line he'll be unveiling this week. Barry shows him a prototype machine they've built designed to record a person's hallucinations. He wants to try it on Max and study their findings, as none of their test subjects have returned to normal since being exposed to Videodrome. He wants to find out why Max is seemingly coping, and he agrees. Max is strapped in, and Barry explains that exposure to sex and violence taps into something within the brain and allows the Videodrome signal to sink in. The machine is turned on, and Max can view his own pixelated world, which will be recorded just as he sees it. It doesn't take long for Nikki to emerge from the shadows, and she turns from pixels to flesh. And by golly, she wants to be whipped. Now she's on that horny TV in the red room, and Max starts whipping her. He's timid at first, but by the end he is really into it. But it's not Nikki on the TV now, it's Masha. Max wakes up in bed, suddenly putting the entire night into question, at least until he rolls over and finds Masha dead in his bed. He calls up Harland and has him come over, requesting that he document what's in his bed. 
But now there isn't anything in Max's bed, and he demands to watch the newest episode of Videodrome. Harlan doesn't take kindly to being treated like a robot, but Max promises to explain everything when they get to the office. He arrives at Harlan's, but he tells Max there was no transmission last night. And there has never been a live Videodrome transmission. In strolls Barry fucking Convex, and Harlan reveals that the footage he was supposedly pirating were just pre-recorded tapes. Barry sent Harlan here two years ago in preparation for this to expose Max to the signal. Barry tells Max to stop denying that he got his kicks from watching torture, but Max asks him if he enjoyed killing Brian Oblivion. Harlan says North America is getting soft while the rest of the world is getting harder, and worthless cesspools like Civic TV are rotting the continent away from the inside. Their plan is to preserve their global power by eliminating these sorts of distractions by killing off those interested in them, starting with Civic TV. Max is like, uh, no, but Barry whips out a horny VHS and he is unable to fight the urge of his nasty chest slit. Barry pops it in and as Max crawls away, Barry's voice plays inside his head telling him to kill his partners and give him Civic TV. To make things easier, here's that tummy gun you lost. And to make sure you don't lose the damn thing again, why don't we just attach it to you? That ought to do it. Max returns to his office and strolls into the conference room, where Moses and Rafe are checking out some new auditions. He quickly shoots Moses to death and Rafe shortly after. Bridey rushes in and helps him out of there, somehow thinking he didn't just kill those two, and he escapes through a back door. By nightfall, he makes his way to the cathode ray mission, with his mission to kill Bianca. He breaks in through the back just as Bianca returns from somewhere, and she quickly realizes Videodrome has control over him. She says they have programmed him to their will, which is currently to destroy all that is left of Brian Oblivion. Max pulls out his undoubtedly stinky gun, but Bianca manages to slip away within the cubicles, and he finds a TV showing Nikki's death. Bianca says they used her image to seduce him, but she's been dead for a while now. The TV turns to static and it whips out a fleshy gun of its own. It shoots Max three times in the chest, which Bianca describes as changing Max's cassette. He is now the video word made flesh, and he's been programmed to kill Videodrome. Max arrives at Spectacular Optical where he momentarily watches a headline about his murders. He watches Harlan arrive, and after talking to an employee, he makes his way to the back. Convex is at the trade show, and Max tells Harlan that Bianca is dead. Harlan has a gross new mission for Max, but when he sticks it inside, he is unable to get his hand out. He eventually rips it out and finds his hand has been turned into whatever the fuck this is. I guess it's a bomb, cause Harlan fucking explodes. On to the big trade show, which is ridiculously busy and ridiculously festive. Barry hops on stage after a bizarre dance number and he talks about the new line's inspiration being taken from Medici, an Italian patron of the arts during the Renaissance. Then Max hops on stage and corners Barry and the terrified crowd watches as he shoots him a bunch of times. Max screams death to Videodrome and Barry's body just bursts into horrendous tumors in a beautiful effect. What's next you may ask? Well, as you may have guessed, Max heads to an abandoned harbor? What the fuck? He makes his way inside this condemned ship which seems to have been utilized by a few vagrants in the past. Hey, it's even got a TV. Nikki tells Max that death is not the end and she can help guide him. Max says he is having trouble getting around, and Nikki explains he has gone as far as he can in his current form. She tells him he hasn't destroyed Videodrome, only hurt them. To finish the job, he'll need to go on to the next phase, meaning he must become the new flesh. She says in order to become the new flesh, the old flesh must die. Max says he is ready, and Nikki even provides him with a tutorial video on how to shoot himself. Now that's what I call a TV dinner. Ready to join Nikki, Max kneels to the ground and kills himself to end the movie. And that's Videodrome. This movie has so many themes and so much symbology, I'm gonna try to scratch the surface of it, but I probably won't get into all of it. One of the biggest ideas explored is TV as control. Oblivion believes television is the strongest force in regards to how people are perceiving reality, so those who have control of what is on TV have the ability to alter the ways people think. Bianca tries to use TV to rehabilitate the homeless, while Max claims to use Civic TV to provide viewers with an outlet for their more perverse ideas. 
A metaphor for this is Max's cavity, he eventually sticks the gun inside and loses it, representing the consumption of violence he is knowingly and unknowingly becoming used to. On the other hand though, it can be argued that this supposed desensitization isn't really the big threat, but Spectacular Optical believes it is. That is why they have this goal of killing the country's undesirables. They believe they are doing a good deed, and they are of course backed by NATO in this experiment. This is where the movie gets especially political, exploring the ideas of what a country could or would do to its screen-addicted citizens. These themes only feel more relevant today as we move beyond just television into the internet and streaming age. Maybe YouTube is the new flesh. Another big theme in Videodrome is overstimulation, which Nikki brings up early in the film. Max is introduced to us already enveloped within television. He goes to bed with Civic TV, wakes up to Bridie instructing him on what he needs to do each day, and spends his days watching endless amounts of sex and violence. His exposure to a new, rougher form of stimulation leaves him bored with the usual kind and causes him to search out this new kind. Tying in with those other themes, Videodrome is really about our own willingness to be manipulated. The TV itself can't control us, but we can allow ourselves to be controlled by it. One of the most exciting aspects of Videodrome is you could watch this movie a hundred times, and each time you could come away with a slightly different variation of how things unfolded. The hallucinations began so mundanely, it's hard to decipher what was actually real in Max's life. How much time did he actually spend with Nikki? She is the embodiment of his desire, but was their entire sexual relationship a hallucination? Who knows? All in all, Videodrome is a confrontational film. It demands the viewer question their own relationship with the screen, reality, and everything in between. It boasts a fantastic cast, jarring cinematography, and some landmark special effects. I'm so happy I decided to review it, it's definitely a movie I'll be thinking about for a while, and I'll definitely be revisiting it soon. Well, that's about it. Next week I'll be reviewing another fantastic horror movie, Dario Argento Suspiria. Thank you all for joining me, and an extra thank you to my patrons. As always, I'm Noah Hook, and this has been Hamburgers and Horror. Stay safe out there. Thanks for watching my review of Videodrome. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe so you can keep up with my weekly horror reviews. And if you want to help support the channel further, you should check out my Patreon account. You'll be able to vote for future movies and franchises I cover on the channel. Thanks, y'all.